Good afternoon. I realize I'm the last thing between you and the cash bar, so let me get straight to it. Um, what I want to talk about is cellulosic biofuels development in the southeastern United States. And to say that if we're going to have cellulosic development anywhere in the United States, it's probably going to be in the south. And <clears throat> the reason this picture is fuzzy is those of you who know the Institutional Review Board of Human Subjects, I have had to fuzz this picture for the anonymity of the subjects. We have a long tradition of distillation work uh, in, in the south. Uh, and so even though Martha was saying that we need uh, advanced training, and I'm sure that's true, we do have a cultural base to start from. And uh, it, though I would note that, of course, they were not uh, distilling wood product here, they were using grains. So, you know, there's some connection here to uh, other forms of uh, energy. But what we really have in, in the South uh, is a lot of wood. Uh, I remember growing up in California and my family was all from Alabama and we'd come back and visit and I remember being really impressed. There's a lot of trees here. In Alabama, it's 71% of the land mass is in commercial forest. In the, in the south, generally, it's in excess of 64%. We have abundant timber and other natural resources. Uh, and that this is the resource base that we are going to use, uh, not only for generating cellulosic bioenergy uh, and biofuels and ethanol specifically, but we're also going to help drive rural development opportunities, something that several other people uh, today have mentioned. I'm glad to hear that. We have something in the, in the range of 200 million, in excess of 200 million acres of forest land in, uh, in the south generally. So we have an abundant resource. It's also a region that, as you can see from, from here, the darker colors are areas of, of poverty. Uh, and you can see, those of you who know anything about the forest products industry, the coastal plain here is an area where you have a, the, the center of the forest products industry in the south, and Appalachia up here where you have coal. So where we have natural resources that are energy related, uh, we also have a great deal of, of poverty. And some of that poverty has been in place for a very long time. We have persistent poverty in, in, uh, in, in many parts of the United States, but they are focused largely in the southeastern United States. If we're going to use bioenergy, cellulosic bioenergy, to address rural development problems and, oppor and create opportunities for people, we need to be cognizant of the social and cultural, political, and economic context within which we're operating. Uh, and design our technologies with these conditions in mind. Now, the bioenergy is no panacea for all the problems that exist uh, within this region, and, and it's not going to solve all of the problems of, of poverty. For one thing, poor people generally don't own land. But it will make a significant contribution, potentially, in creating economic opportunity and employment uh, and, uh, and income opportunities. Now, uh, Ambassador Schein uh, this morning, uh, in her very interesting talk, uh, spoke about the, f the response of Denmark to the uh, energy shocks of the early 1970s. Uh, we went through the same thing in this, this country. We had a lot of effort put into bioenergy, into alternative energy forces, but the uh, subsequent decline in energy prices, particularly in the 1980s, uh, led to a uh, diminution of investment in this area, and we've only more recently, uh, in the mid-2000s, come around to looking at bioenergy as prices went back up again. In this uh, graph, you see that there's a, a number of news articles we were tracing. This is a research project with several colleagues, and we were looking at national, regional, and state Alabama, three newspapers, the coverage on bioenergy. And so you can see from 99 to 2009, there was a pattern, and there was great interest starting in 05 and particularly 06, 07, and 08 on bioenergy kinds of, kinds of issues. So there was a lot of, con, uh, of interest in bioenergy. Much of that interest, come on, you. 
Thank you. Uh, much of that interest uh, shaded uh, initially toward positive, uh, looking at, at bioenergy as something that was positive and biofuels as positive. But as we moved past 2007 into eight and nine, there, turned, there turned, tended to be a uh, change in attitude toward looking at bioenergy because most of the bioenergy was corn-based, corn ethanol, and there were issues associated with food and food security and the con trust and conflict between growing food for energy and gro growing corn for energy, growing corn for food. So there was a, a change in the attitude associated with, um, with the bioenergy arena. And part also because large corporations started to be seen as having control over and gaining the primary benefit from bioenergy production. It was no longer a local issue, but when you look at this, at these figures, or these, uh, these figures, you find that the positive, which is in the green here, is, is most, when, when, the is, when the issues covered in the news article are local, that's where you have your positive, uh, at, your positive attributions within, within the media coverage. The coverage in the media was positive when it was dealing with local issues, and not so much when it became um, a national uh, or international issue. Now, I mentioned that the South is the wood basket of the United States, and this shows what, what we have for harvests, uh, most recent data that I could find, 2009. Uh, the darker the red, the more the harvests. This is a little bit dis misleading, this figure, because uh, the county sizes in the South are really very small, and the county sizes in, up in Maine and the and Pacific Northwest are relatively large. The point is that the Southeast is a major center for, for timber production. And our resource, um, this is an unusual stand of forest, but uh, nonetheless, what we have is, is a very rapid growing uh, timber resource here in the South, uh, perhaps even more so than in, than in Missouri. Uh, we have abundant rainfall, warm temperatures, uh, high humidity, uh, long growing seasons, and we have an infrastructure that is timber oriented. With that much timber land, as I described, we've got the harvesting and the planting and the transporting and the processing. We've got the infrastructure in place to move product uh, out of the woods to mills, to pulp mills, or to biorefineries. We also have an abundant supply. In fact, we've been taking off less than we've been growing for a number of years. Uh, the decline that you see here in the, on the right-hand side of the, of the figure is largely due to changes in uh, imports of softwoods from, from, uh, from uh, Canada, also some imports from Brazil and elsewhere. Um, but the point basically is that we have abundant resources within the South to support a biofuels energy system using wood-based uh, feedstocks. We can't over-harvest, over clearly. We've done that before in our history in the last century. Uh, there is a danger of over-harvesting our timber resources, but there would be no problem in, in, in meeting part of our energy needs through bioenergy and therefore produce also supporting rural development uh, agendas. In addition to wood, we also have um, various um, grass species, miscanthus and, and uh, switchgrass, that are also uh, quite suitable in, in the southeast. So in short, we've got abundant natural resources, abundant sources of biomass for cellulosic bioenergy. Uh, we've also done some survey work, uh, and others have done the similar kind of work that indicate the landowners are quite willing, in fact, to sell the biomass for bioenergy. In fact, one, some of the respondents we had in Alabama said, yeah, I don't want to sell my wood for uh, timber or for uh, pulp wood, but if it's for energy, that's something good. So that some of the landowners actually had a very positive at, uh, attitude toward selling, producing biomass for, for energy because they saw this as a environmentally positive thing. What we're waiting for, however, is evidence that there's going to be um, commercial viability based on technical and economic grounds. Now, we'll learn maybe more uh, tomorrow and the next day on uh, the technical attributes associated with cellulosic bioenergy. Um, 
But the economics are, the, are one of the troubling things. As I said, back in the 1970s, the, the rapid uptick and then the rapid decline in the 1980s of energy prices cut the knees out from under bioenergy um, investment. And the same seemed to have been the case more recently. As, as Hank mentioned, a number of firms were planning on, on, on starting production and, and nothing's come out of the ground yet. Or very Many companies have, have s s stepped back from, per from uh, investment because of the energy declines that occurred uh, with the recent uh, Great Recession. So the volatility of energy markets, the recent increase in, in uh, gas and oil uh, supply due to fracking, all of these are the uncertainties that investors are having to deal with when they are making decisions on whether to invest in, in bioenergy. So why is a sociologist interested in, in, in bioenergy and technology generally? Well, for two reasons. One, energy is literally the lifeblood of a modern society. We all used energy to get here. I'm looking into two very bright lights which are burning energy. Uh, I've got monitors, we all like got electricity. We're all using um, uh, electronic devices. Energy is the lifeblood of, of our society and how it's produced, how it's distributed, uh, and who controls the, uh, the energy production is, has profound implications for our society. Uh, we know that uh, in, with the fossil fuels based industry, uh, energy system that uh, concentration of power has been in relatively few hands. We also know that the fossil fuel based economies uh, have led to an periodic energy crises. We've had certain costs associated with uh, propping up uh, regimes in different parts of the world or toppling regimes in different parts of the world or protecting shipping lanes. Uh, we've had to deal with the consequences of global climate change. Uh, and we have to realize, of course, that peak oil is upon us uh, and that, there are, that fossil fuels are, in any event, uh, finite. So there are all, all kinds of reasons why society and therefore sociologists should be, at, be paying attention to energy issues. And the second reason is that sociologists and rural sociologists, particularly like myself, have been studying the impact of technology on society for a very long time. We've been looking at the impact of mechanization in agriculture. This is sort of a grass, the, the, the essence of rural sociology in my discipline. But we've also looked at uh, the impact of mechanization and uh, the investment of capital resources into forestry. Uh, the, the equipment that, that Hank showed up there, uh, of the feller bunchers and skidders and, and knuckle boom loaders, that's a lot of capital investment to, to harvest timber. It used to be you're out there with a flatbed truck and a, and a and a buck saw or maybe a chainsaw. Now you've got to have upwards of a million dollars to be a conventional logger. So investment in technology has driven uh, increasing productivity, increasing wages for those who are employed, but also reduced the number of people who are employed. You see the same thing happening, of course, in fisheries and agriculture, manufacturing, across the gamut of our economy. So we're interested as sociologists, I'm interested as a sociologist in, in how technologies develop and how they impact communities and society generally. Uh, and in the case of bioenergy, the reason I'm interested in this is that there's an opportunity here for improving the quality of life in the rural south. Uh, and I think the cellulosic bioenergy in particular is, is an important area for us to be looking at. Uh, several years ago, some, some colleagues of mine and I uh, did interviews with a number of stakeholders, researchers, policymakers, forest land owners, investors, corporate officials. And were, we were asking them, where do we think the bioenergy and, and cellulosic bioenergy industry is going to go? Uh, and we had some fairly uh, interesting uh, results. One of the key things that they pointed out was, well, the South is the center, is the wood basket of the United States. And we've got uh, really a good infrastructure, as I mentioned, for bringing in the resource to the, to the mills, and this could also be to the biorefineries. But they mentioned, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier today, that uh, we're probably only going to be building biorefineries on a relatively small scale because of logistic constraints. Wood is heavy and relatively compared to petroleum products, gas, uh, or even coal, not very energy dense. And so moving timber, uh, moving wood a great distance to, uh, to a biorefinery is costly. So you're going to be pulling in 
uh, biomass from a relatively small distance, maybe up to 50 miles, maybe, maybe hopefully less than that. And the capacities, therefore, of your biorefineries, you're not going to be building biorefineries at the scale of the petrochemical industry. You're going to be building relatively small biorefineries, such as Steve mentioned in, uh, in Iowa, of the uh, 30 million gallons per year. Now, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of fuel, but it's nothing like the major. And here's a picture of a, of a small biorefinery that's being developed in, in uh, West Alabama. It's not the scale of the large uh, petrochemical plants. The capital investments, and this is a key issue, the capital investments associated with these smaller biorefineries are within the range of local investors, the financial, local financial markets, local even communities. There, we may be ranging in the, in the $30 million or so. That's a lot of money. But in Lee County, Alabama, where I live, where Auburn University is located, I think you could mobilize $30 million from local investors if you had a good business plan. It doesn't have to be ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil's got a place in the world, but our future does not have to be in the ExxonMobil le levels of investment. It can be something that's, that's much smaller. And we could end up with a distributed uh, energy system that looks something like this. Some of these um, are pulp and paper mills. Let me get this thing working here. The little things that look like mills. Uh, and then the uh, triangles are where we thought we could locate three or four um, bioenergy uh, plants within the state of Alabama, looking at um, uh, the availability of, of, of biomass. So I'm pretty confident that we can do this and have a distributed uh, system of biorefineries. I'm a little less confident that, our, uh, that the ownership of these biorefineries is going to be, oops, is going to be... Um, Distrib uh, widely distributed, that we're not going to have concentration of ownership because a lot of the oil majors are sitting on the side. I've done some interviews with, uh, I won't mention companies, but they're well-known national companies. And they've basically said, yeah, we're, we formed a joint venture here and we're not really putting money into research because there's all these universities and other labs out there doing the work. And we're just going to wait till somebody figures out what is absolutely the best thing and then we're either going to buy or we're going to le or, or, you know, lease the technology ourselves. We're going to let it do. But we're going to just let the early innovators and the, the, the early failures take place. The big companies have got political, uh, political capital, financial capital. They're the ones that benefit largely from our current uh, uh, corn-based ethanol system through the blending uh, process. They're the ones who get a lot of the, the, re the returns and invest uh, from their political investments within, with our current bioenergy system. We can think of in advance both the technological and the policy uh, adjustments that it might be necessary to allow the benefits of a cellulosic bioenergy system to be more widely distributed than they are right now. Now, this is a good uh, slide for uh, discussion on class warfare. If anybody wants to get in that, we can do that over drinks in the, in the reception. But the point that I want to make is that in the last decades in our society, economic power and wealth has become increasingly concentrated. This is nothing new to you, um, perhaps. But it's important to recognize that this concentration is mostly a, a, an urban phenomenon. It's not people in the rural south that are making those, those added incomes, where 1% of the total population is making 17% of, of all income within the, within the nation. Those people, at those 1%, are not rural people. They don't live in Wilcox County, Alabama. They live in New York City or Boston or, or, or Los Angeles or some, some metropolitan place like that. Well, that's OK. But what this means is what Ross Perot called that great sucking sound. Anybody remember Ross Perot? Uh, what we have is the great sucking sound of wealth coming out of rural areas into the metropolitan areas. And that's driven largely by the nature of our economy, which is increasingly controlled by relatively few and very large corporate actors. Now, that is the nature of our economy. Anybody not have a any, you know, anybody with a pension fund on here is 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 a good capitalist and supported by these large corporations because our pensions are probably heavily invested in these corporations. But what is happening as a result of this wealth concentration in corporate hands 
is the draining of the wealth and opportunity in rural America. Just a slide showing a little bit of data that, that a colleague of mine did, in, uh, Larry Teeter in the School of Forestry at Auburn, uh, using M-Plan, uh, basically looking at what the opportunities, uh, economic impact of one 30 million gallon a year biofuel system, uh, cellulosic biofuel refinery would be in West Alabama, a rural area. Okay, not a lot, 356 jobs, but it, we're talking about places where jobs are very scarce especially good paying jobs and good paying jobs that require certain technical skills. You could change not only the employment opportunities, but the whole nature of what education stands for and represents in a rural area. The dollar fix figures are important as well, but so too are the jobs and the, and the prospects for, for opportunity that, that might not otherwise not be available. Uh, can we do this? Can, can local investors uh, mobilize the financial capital adequate to invest in a, a $30 million or more cellulosic biorefinery. Well, I think if we can, uh, state, I'll speak of the state of Alabama, provide uh, tax incentives and abatements for Mercedes-Benz and Hyundai and Tyson Krupp and, and your other states can talk about your same other, other investments uh, for large corporations, we can also put money into this, these smaller kinds of operations where the impact on the local economy can actually be pretty great. There's real differences between uh, the, the uh, bioenergy and, and, the, um, and, and petroleum based, based economies. Uh, we know that, for example, uh, that the Corporations that, that control the petroleum-based economies are distant. They're international in capital and, and in organization. The, the concentrated control by, by corporate and state actors in the petroleum-based economy has led to some of the problems I've mentioned. Uh, there are environmental problems. This is a picture taken in Alaska. should make you think of the Exxon Valdez. Uh, and the contrast to it, with the petroleum-based economy, which is distant, where you, the, the, the material may be coming from thousands of miles away, the petroleum uh, may come, uh, be refined a thousand miles from where we use it, and the, distant, and the dis difference between that kind of system and a local bioenergy, cellulosic bioenergy system, is fairly significant, where you have local landowners, local loggers, local, local biorefineries, and keeping the money, as Hank said, keeping the money in the local economy instead of shipping it out. This is the kind of vision that this character, some of you may recognize Jimmy Carter, great Georgian, great American, uh, one of our most un underappreciated presidents in my personal view. Uh, but whatever you may think of Jimmy Carter and what he's done in, after the presidency, while he was president, he said, Energy policy is the immoral equivalent of war. And it's not that he was saying, oh, we need to go to war and get more energy. That was not the point at all. His point was, energy policy is very important. It's going to be important in terms of how we look at our society, how the benefits of, of, of our society are distributed. And these are the kinds of questions that we need to be thinking about as we're doing our research. The faculty here, I hope you'll You'll be training your students not only in the best technologies, but for them to, under, for, to help your students and those students who are here to understand that the impact of technologies are real. The choices we make when we design technologies are real. The scales of operation, the scales of the technologies have consequences. And what we need to be doing is not necessarily small is beautiful, but bigger is not necessarily better either. We need scale appropriate technologies, including scales where local investors can meet local needs using local resources. Thank you. Connor, thank you. Uh, questions? All right, I have. Everybody is ready <laughs> for a drink. Right here There's is one. one. Raise your hand again. Thank you. Um, history does repeat itself, correct? 
And you alluded to the uh, drop in hydrocarbon prices that brought down all the efforts of the 70s and 80s, and you now have extraordinary amounts of hydrocarbons and certainly natural gas, uh, long, long term, relatively low price. Uh, looking forward toward this subject, uh, how do you see these things going? If you, if you look at that, uh, that one graph that I had that showed the, the, gra the, the long term um, increase in prices of, of, of energy, and then that little pre precipitous drop, maybe somebody's looking for me for right, helping me for that. There you go. Uh, you can see that there is a secular trend there. Um, and while fracking has, has opened up new opportunities for, for gas and also petroleum oil, uh, I, I, th I think the, you know, the easiest plays have probably been hit and it's gonna become increasingly difficult uh, I think if, if we have to we have to take a long-term uh, view of, of, of energy prices, and my guess is that you know that that level that we're at right now around $100 uh, a gallon, uh, we're not going to be spending a lot of time below that, and we're probably going to be spending much more time closer to 150 and and down the line above. Now you got to con consider infl inflation issues as well, but. But energy energy prices are going north. And they're not going. They're going. They're going higher, not lower, in the in the in the sh in the long term. In the if you think in terms of decades, you're going to have that volatility, and that's the volatility that makes investors really nervous. But but the up but the the that ev that that figure tells me upward. And I don't I don't see any way around it. You have um, a uh, question in the back. Okay. Just one question is for you. Uh, my name is Cesar for uh, University of Florida. Here. I'm, I'm staring into bright light, so uh -huh. wave your hand at me. <laughs> okay. Um, rural areas are more um, intelligent to say something, consuming energy, and, less, and have less consumption than urban areas, on your perception. Uh, what should be the path we should go to make responsible to urban areas in the, in the energy consumption from the point of view of uh, society? <clears throat> well, I, if you look at energy consumption in, in a, on a per capita basis, I'm not sure that, that I would, and, and, and then you look and you sort of equalize across the income stream, I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree that on a per capita basis, rural people are more energy conscious. They may be poorer and not have as much uh, disposable income to invest in, 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 in energy. If they're not poor, uh, they're probably driving long distances to go to work. Uh, and if you're in an urban setting such as New York, we're using mass transit. Um, I, I, it's not clear to me that urban and uh, that those distinctions are, are, are in fact, as you, as you, as you called them. Now, if you're talking about in other parts of the world uh, where um, petroleum-based uh, economies are not the, the dominant reality. I lived in Southeast Asia and worked in villages for 10 years. Um, those people were very energy, <laughs> energy uh, um, they were miserly with their, with their energy use because they didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have a lot of internal combustion engines, um, had a little kerosene lamp maybe, no electricity. So they didn't use very much energy. Uh, so that would, in many parts of the world, what you describe would be true. Uh, but I think there's much to be said for smart urban uh, growth where you have uh, public transit and, um, and not a lot of the individual homes, such as I have, where, where that, are, that are not as energy efficient as uh, you know, larger buildings, for example. So I, I don't know what I can, what, how I can really address your question, because I'm not sure that the, that uh, at least in the United States, that the basis of that question is correct. I hate to be argumentative, but. Okay, I think. Thank you.